Wow, that was really great. I love that a lot. I got a better idea. Follow me. That was so inspiring. I wish to recreate it. When you wish upon a star. Hello, Mr. Stag. Are you here to file for creative bankruptcy? Yes. The art of cinematic storytelling is hard. There's a reason that marrying a good script with good visual storytelling is applauded the way that it is. When it comes to Walt Disney Pictures, their catalogue of films is nothing short of impressive. The quality of their animated films in both story and visual elements are the reason they live in our household memory. So with that being said, why is it so difficult for Disney to retell their legacy stories to a new generation? Since the late 1990s, Disney have been remaking their animated films to a more miss than hit kind of beat. One, two, three, go! Disney themselves have even said that they are remaking these films to introduce them to a new audience whilst also trying to appease long-term fans. This, this is important that we're gonna come back to it. Shh. <laughs> introduce them to new generations. Wait a second, did we run out of Disney? Love? We're out of Lilo and Stage. La Crista! Yeah, actually, never mind. The old films are still there to watch, even on their own streaming platform. So why bot? Oh, money. Which would you rather admit to? Being creatively bankrupt or just wanting more money? Answer the question. So what's bad? Why is it bad? Well, I took to my Patreon to find out the worst of the kind to dive into and dissect. So, let's start off with our least offensive contender. Sort of. Aladdin, 2019. 1992's Aladdin was inspired by the folklore of the same name from the book 1001 Nights, known in English as Arabian Nights. <laughs> let's not do that. <laughs> let's, let's not do that. So here is why this works over this. There is a vital P word in filmmaking that stops the audience from getting bored or confused or whiplashed or angry. Pacing is incredibly important because you need to allow scenes to breathe whilst also allowing for the development of things like plot points, character beats, environmental storytelling, all whilst giving your audience the time to process everything whilst not dragging or rushing it. So with that in mind, here is the first 10 minutes of 1992's Aladdin summed up. 1992's Aladdin opens with a wraparound narrator. This also is important. We will also come back to this. We are introduced to Agrabah, Jafar, who is pushing a thief into the Cave of Wonders, which is summoned with a scarab. And then also there's uh, Iago, his parrot, Complete contrast. Jeez, where'd you dig this pozo up? Jafar is instructed to find someone whose value is buried deep within. Boom, we've got our villain. <laughs> then boom. All this for a loaf of bread? We meet Aladdin, a charming young thief stealing bread. Through the song One Jump, Aladdin is shown to be a charmer who everyone knows in Agrabah. After the theft of the bread, Aladdin sits down with Abu and we are given a moment where Aladdin notices two kids scrounging for food near some bins. It's here we establish two very important things. Aladdin can be selfless and kind, and Abu is very greedy. So Bosh, 10 minutes of the full 90 dedicated to establishing the setting, the hero, and the villain. So what does the 2019 Aladdin do in his first 10 minutes? We get a wraparound intro, the genie is a human talking to his children about the story of Aladdin. Then we get a big old one which introduces the streets of Agrabah, Aladdin the thief just stealing because the palace, the princess, the cave of wonders, Jafar with a bunch of palace guards, Aladdin stealing again, he goes to the seal lady from his standards for dates, he stops for a sec, he eats them and sees some homeless kids, he hands them the bag before leaving, then Jasmine gives bread to hungry kids, meets Aladdin, he saves her from getting a bracelet stolen, then we get one jump, now it's another 10 minutes. What have we actually established that the viewers are getting, assuming they haven't seen the first film? Aladdin's a good thief, there, there's a weird cave, um, he's kind, I guess, he has a monkey. Um, okay, so now do you see the problem with cramming too much into too little time? This is a massive problem with 2019's pacing. It's too quick. Just like me, you ah. Sorry about that. It's a creative decision for the worse because it's cramming far too much into far too little time. Also notice that we never met Jasmine in that first 10 minutes in 1992. 
This is important because what follows is a scene with Jasmine in the palace garden which gives us another naturally flowing piece of exposition whereupon we see Jasmine's strained relationship with her father the Sultan, her need to marry in three days, Jasmine's want for independence and her life outside the walls of the palace. Followed naturally by Jafar's introduction as the Sultan's advisor and wanting to manipulate the Sultan. Exposition is a necessary evil in any movie and there is a natural way to do it and an unnatural way to do it. 1992 has a natural flow to its exposition because of the scene, the interaction between the characters, the flow of the dialogue. 2019 Aladdin takes Jasmine back to his gaff and there's some really, really clumsy dialogue. You should tell the princess to get out more. They won't let her ever since my... Uh? The queen was killed. Jasmine just vomits up incredibly personal information to a practical stranger and... Why? Exposition. Speaking of clumsy dialogue, this film is full of it. There's a rule in screenwriting, which is to constantly ask yourself, why? Why is a character saying this? Why is a character doing this? Why is a character going here? Why is a character acting in a certain way? And if you can't answer those questions reasonably, don't do it. Jasmine's song in 2019 is a prime culprit of why? It's an original inclusion which some may applaud, but the problem is, is that everything that gets said in the song has already just been established in the scene that comes right before it. Not be a sultan, because it has never been done in the thousand year history of our kingdom. The sultan's been afraid, so she's kept locked away. Sometimes I feel like I'm trapped. Think of it like this. Is this dumb? Yes, I know I owe you for that time that you saved me from that burning orphanage, but I just haven't got time. The village cake fit is tomorrow and I have to win. Goodbye, my lover and best friend, Spider-Man. I think maybe you get the point now, yeah? And honestly, you can sum up the shortfalls of Aladdin from 2019 under one umbrella. Creative decisions. The thing is, you can have the best script in the world, but if it gets to production and all of the production decisions are for the worse, it's all gonna come undone. Let's start with the casting. Will Smith acting as the genie is the breath of fresh air that this film really needs, but his vocal performance really suffers. Jafar does not look or sound intimidating at all. The only thing that he has going for him is like the crazy eyes. I actually wrote in my notes, uh, Jafar looks like I could bully him. Sultan's performance is flatter than Aladdin singing. Iago sounds like someone stepped on his throat before he stepped in the vocal booth. The writing. If you're gonna make a grittier looking version of Aladdin, why not play into that? The scene of the carpet stalking Aladdin in the original is completely gone in 2019. And instead, we just get a dumpy piece of dialogue. This is a magic carpet. No shit. Have a scene where the carpet is stalking from the shadows where you can't necessarily make out what it is, like a predator, only for it to be revealed as a rug. That would have been funny. Instead of Jafar tricking Aladdin from the dungeon as an old ass man, he just literally sits down and talks to him, which is so f***ing weak. Jafar's cunning from the original is completely gone. You put a handmaid in only to serve as a love interest to the genie, which puts her in a box and ultimately completely decimates the idea that women are breaking the mold because Jasmine's character is all about independence and women stepping up and being their own woman. But having this character literally contradicts the idea of From a whole new world onwards, it's practically the same film. And that is to say that it's fine. But if it's so close to the original, why bother? You see, that's the catch-22 with remaking a film. You have to transform it in some way to justify its existence, but in attempting to transform it, you run the risk of completely destroying it. Look at old boy. If it's so close to the original, why bother? And if it's so far removed from the original source for the worse, why bother? Worse still, the problems that are in the original Aladdin aren't even fixed in the remake. Do you remember the wraparound that I was talking about? The wraparound in the first movie never crops up again. The remake could have fixed that, but instead it just does the exact same thing. Which stack is the wraparound? 
sound very brief. Just randomly cutting back to the boat from the beginning doesn't absolve the wraparound. It's lazy, and all you're doing is referencing the fact that you didn't fix it. So Aladdin, 2019. Here are its problems. Now, do you remember what I said Disney's goal was in the beginning? To attract new fans while simultaneously appeasing the long-term fans. Well, I put a poll on this here YouTube to gauge whether people thought Aladdin was a good film or not. And... It's not very good. So let's see if the same problems persist in our next live action film. Patreon, what is it? Greetings, tis I, Patreon. God? Yes. Anyway, here's the next thing. Um. Wow. I've never seen a group of more beautiful and well-hung people in my entire life. Fuck. According to the poll that I put up here on YouTube, Pinocchio would actually appear to be one of the lesser offenders in Disney's live action catalog, but in accordance with my Patreon poll, it would appear to be the most offensive. So what do the audiences think of all this? Visually dazzling, but soulless. This isn't a real movie. Tales to deliver. Seductive timelessness. Garbage. Okay, okay, it's bad. The writing's on the wall. Good joke, me. <laughs> but why? Is it bad because it falls into the same problems as Aladdin? Or for different reasons. I mean, it came out a few years later than Aladdin, so maybe they learned their lesson. <laughs> Let's just give it a chance. When you wish upon a star, your dreams come true. <sighs> I think I know why Kurt did it. Oh, right, okay. Graphic design is hard. Character design is hard. Video graphics are hard. Here is the original Jiminy Cricket. And here is a cricket. Jiminy doesn't look like a cricket. And you know what? That's fine. That's okay. Because he's instead incredibly stylized. And that's the artistic decision for a lot of Disney properties. Look at Winnie the Pooh. Winnie the Pooh doesn't really look like a real bear. The character is separated from the creature. But in Pinocchio 2022's case, it almost feels like they got stuck between the John Favreau approach of photorealism and um, stylism. And instead, that just means that they fell headfirst into the uncanny valley. We're still, this is the first thing that we see in the film and first impressions go a long way in a movie. Okay, gang, let's put our best foot forward. Unless a cricket, more a Brussels sprout with a hat. And lo and behold, once again, the creative decisions that have been made in this film are absolutely baffling not only on a character front but let's just quickly wrap that up figaro is cgi for the sake of being cgi there is a seagull called sophia whose cg is on par with valiant from 2005 honest john somehow looks incredible like he's actually part of the scene with incredible expressions which brings keegan michael key's performance to life but this immediately makes pinocchio's cgi look whack cgi can look great when it's done right but when you are basing your film in the real world and making basically everything cg and also not great cg your CG is gonna clash with your real world in loads. And clash in this film, it does. Let's just work on the list, shall we? Great, look, it's that P word again. Oh, hey. Without summing the entire plot up of an 80 year old film that I'm sure you've already seen, by the 35th minute of the original film, we have already established Pinocchio, the rest of the main characters, Pinocchio's quest, and also his first failure. In 2022 Pinocchio, however, we are still with Honest John, and the scenes just go on, and on, and on, and on, and on. So is the problem with 2022 is that it's too slow? No, because, well, I'll get onto that. So many scenes are just inserted into 2022, uh, to, um, uh, to, uh, actually, I don't know because they don't really transform the original and they add no substance. So, <sighs> Pinocchio drags in places, but at equal parts, feels like it realizes that it's all running out of runtime and just 
any percent speed runs the third act. It's like when you're writing a sentence and then you start to run out of room at the end of the line and you try to just squeeze the last of the letters in and ah, oh, fuck. The original Pinocchio from 1940 tells its story in a tight 90, meaning that it tells its full narrative and conveys its important message within that time. Now, Pinocchio 2022, on the other hand, has an almost two hour runtime, and not only does it fail to tell the same story, but it fumbles the message in its entirety. Pinocchio 2022 starts out with a really long and cringe interaction between Jiminy and himself, and then we meet Geppetto, who we actually established this time around has lost his son some time ago. But then it all goes to pot. There's a rule in screenwriting, yeah, another one, uh, there's a lot, um, and that rule is a uh, show. Don't tell. Showing not only saves screen time, but it also feeds the art form because visual elements are what make cinema. What's the point in watching something if you could listen to it and get the same experience? Geppetto telling us that he lost his son in a little song with a photo of him on his desk is far from perfect, but hey, it's better than I don't know, saying something like, uh, oh, I can't get rid of these clocks. These clocks are way too important to me. I made them for my wife, you know, made them for my wife. She loved these clocks so very much, uh, but she didn't love these clocks as much as she loved you, little boy. Hmm, I wonder what in I could maybe call you, little wooden boy. You are made of pine. Yeah, I will call you Pinocchio. Maybe we can talk about how he's made of pine a few times. Imagine if he actually said that in the real film. My most special creation. But never as much as she loves you, my dear. You see, the joke was funnier because I did it for longer. The fact that I extended the joke is actually what made it funnier because longer means better. <laughs> If I wrote this and handed it to my screenwriting lecturer when I was at uni, he would have burned it in front of me. Trust me. The dialogue is stilted and awfully written. Scenes are extended with little to no substance. The additions to the script in the name of remaking it just hinder the story and halt the pacing in its entirety. And your honor, I would like to present the defendant's worst offense. The original Pinocchio's message is for Pinocchio to prove himself unselfish, brave, truthful, and know the difference between right and wrong in order to become a real boy. His ultimate test coming in the form of Pleasure Island. The scene transitions of which are completely different. 1940 Pinocchio ends up going to Pleasure Island after escaping captivity from Stromboli's, a scene in which he learns that lying is wrong after trying to lie to the fairy, which in itself carries a message. You see, Pinocchio, a lie keeps growing and growing until it's as plain as the nose on your face. The fairy gives Pinocchio a second chance so long as he makes good on his goals. In his attempt to get home, however, there is another encounter with Honest John after a pretty terrifying scene with an evil coachman. Honest John succeeds in sending Pinocchio to Pleasure Island where he meets Lampwick, a dickhead. Now on Pleasure Island in the 1940s film, Pinocchio is completely influenced by Lampwick. He's starting fights, he's indulging in the food, he's smoking, he's destroying property, he's drinking underage, and making himself sick on smoke and losing the faith of Jiminy Cricket until... You'd think something was gonna happen to us. So Pinocchio starts to turn into a donkey because of the consequences of your actions. Meanwhile, in the better version. Pinocchio is made to lie in order to escape confinement instead of getting help from the fairy, not only losing the lesson that lying is bad, but teaching that lying is a good idea to get out of a tight spot. Then Pinocchio just sort of goes to Pleasure Island after landing on a coach by complete chance instead of being lied to and persuaded by strangers. On Pleasure Island in the remake, the the beer is gone, replaced instead with root beer, which kids can drink anyway. And Pinocchio doesn't even drink it. Pinocchio doesn't even take part in anything bad that happens on the island. Instead, he actively looks on in disgust. Clearly disturbed by Lampwick throwing a glass. Retching over the gluttony. Looking on in disgust at the thieves. All culminating in a set piece taking place in a clock shop where naughty kids are breaking all of these clocks. And hey, if there's one thing that this dialogue's taught us is that Geppetto really, really loves clocks. So what do you think would be really impactful? Let me ask you what would be more effective to see. Pinocchio 
finally giving in to the pressures and impulsive behaviors around him and destroying a clock, maybe even a cuckoo clock, which we know means a lot to Geppetto, which would be heartbreaking for us to see as an audience, but also show that Pinocchio was now starting to behave badly. Oh, Lampwick just doing it on his own and Pinocchio actively condemning it. Just take a look at what Pinocchio 22 does. So great, Pinocchio didn't do anything wrong. So he's not gonna face the same consequences as 1940s Pinocchio, right? Well, no, because he still turns into a donkey anyway. What are the rules? What are the rules? What are the rules? They put these cloud people in to abduct the donkeys instead of it just being a bunch of nefarious blokes. Jiminy discovers all of the donkeys and delivers the exact same line from the 1940 film of oh, What's with all the donkeys? Now in the original film it makes sense because he just stumbles into a dock and there's a bunch of men moving donkeys onto a ship but in this one there is literal f***ing cloud people and he's like oh, What's with all the donkeys? I don't know! Maybe worry about the cloud people that are in the fuck that are- what? I, I yelled for a long time. Let's just move on. Performances. They are bad. We double crossed every, every play. Anybody, anybody, please, just call anybody. Pinocchio. Pine, Pinocchio, Pinocchio. Wouldn't want that on my conscience. Chris Pine. The ending of the original Pinocchio results in Pinocchio turning into a real boy after sacrificing his safety to save Geppetto, which shows that he's selfless, being brave by facing up to the monstro. I still think this reveal is really funny. Pinocchio! <laughs> 2022 just has a Pinocchio cry on Geppetto, bringing Geppetto back to life, and then they wander off into the background, and as they wander off, Pinocchio turns into a real boy, but Geppetto, but no, Jimny comes up on the screen, and he says, ah, well, maybe he turned into a real boy, and it's like, we just fucking watched it. Look, there's a reason why Guillermo del Toro's Pinocchio was nominated for Best Animated Picture, and this one wasn't. Pinocchio kills Jiminy Cricket. That's he so kills crazy, Jiminy Cricket that's and like, he does it with a so hammer. Crazy. Oh, the Little Mermaid. The worst polled on YouTube and Patreon. This video's already gone on for a long time, so... Let's do this one quickly. How's the movie? Bad. How are the characters? Bad. How's the pacing? Bad. How's the music? Bad. Is it worth watching? No. Is the original better? Yes. Will you make more FNAF content? Maybe. Is it time to end the video? Finally. Okay, fine. If you want to see me look at that film properly, let me know in the comments below and I will. But until then, I have to thank my patrons, Hugo Hart, Maven, Casey Young, Barry the Awesome 23, and Owen Rico for their continued support over on Patreon, of which you too can support me with the link below. But otherwise, until next time, thank you for watching. I've been Stag. You as always have been wonderful. Bye bye!